Thank you, David, for that very moving uh, speech. And this is, I guess, what brings us to our, our final talk. You know, we are talking about people, really, who in many ways can't defend themselves. And this has been the cornerstone of Cage Prisoners' work ever since we formed in 2003. That when we saw the images of those who were locked in these chicken wire cages in Guantanamo Bay, and at least from the Muslim community, there was practically silence around the world. We knew that there had to be something, there had to be some kind of voice that came from within the community that was speaking about due process, that was speaking about the right to a fair trial, that would speak about the fact that it's okay to be Muslim and still stand up for justice just because you represent the interests of those who are detained without charge or trial, it doesn't make you a terrorist as well. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have access to the rule of law. And this is really where our, our work has been trying to focus all these years, to try and give Muslim and non-Muslim communities the confidence that you can speak about some very, very difficult issues without feeling like you are criminalizing yourself in the process. And of course, one of the hardest areas of this work, uh, at least you know, in terms of all the investigation work that I've done, uh, and the, the rest of our staff at Cage Prisoners, is the work on rendition, torture, black sites, because there is no information. Usually it takes a long time. You speak to a detainee who finally gets released after years, and he says, oh, you know that client you've been looking for all this time who's been in, um, in, in, in forced disappearance? Well, I met him when he was in this prison in Pakistan. He's been moved now, but I met him for a short while, and he told me X, Y, and Z. That's how we do the investigation work with these cases. Because quite often, like with Masood Ahmed Janju in Pakistan, they never come home. He was arrested in 2006. He's still missing till this very day. Many people believe him to be dead. And these are the conditions we find ourselves working in. And hopefully, Toby will be able to tell us a lot more about that. So Toby Cadman, please. If it's OK, um, I'll remain seated, because I'm, I very rarely find myself in a courtroom these days. Um, I spend most of my time seated in front of a computer, unfortunately. Um, one of the first things I want to say is, I, I remember when I was first called to the bar, um, I was looking at the Times newspaper, um, and I don't know if they still do it, but there was a cartoon strip called um, Queen's Council. And I'll never forget, there was a, a picture of a, uh, a wealthy fat cat sitting in his chair talking to his criminal client when his client was asking um, for justice. And so the QC looked at him and said, well, how much justice can you afford? Um, that's an unfortunate reality um, of the system. What I do, which I'll go through in some detail, um, as much detail as I can for the time allowed, um, involves being more than just a lawyer. Um, I've been accused of being many things, uh, a lobbyist, a lawyer, um, a threat to national security in at least one country. Um, but it does require you to, to approach these cases very differently. Um, I wanted to just read one quote um, that uh, I hope Lucinda doesn't mind. I'll take full credit for now. Um, we've been involved with defending individuals in Bangladesh for some time, uh, which is a, a very difficult case. And one of the quotes that uh, we have used um, in one of our final trial briefs is from um, Justice Robert Jackson, um, Chief Prosecutor of the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. And I think it's uh, uh, as important a statement today as it was then. If you are determined to execute a man in any case, there is no occasion for a trial. The world yields no respect to courts that are merely organized to convict. We must never forget that the record on which we judge these defendants today is the record upon which history will judge us tomorrow. To pass these defendants a poised chalice is to put it to our lips as well. We must summon such detachment and intellectual integrity to our task that this trial will commend itself to posterity as fulfilling humanity's aspiration to justice. Now, I've quoted that on a number of occasions, speaking particularly about Bangladesh, but speaking about dealing with these types of cases. I'm very fortunate some might say unfortunate in, in the cases that I've been involved with over the last few years. 
Um, I'm still relatively young, considering I was called to the bar in 2001. Um, but the first case that I worked on was in Bosnia. Um, I arrived in Bosnia to, be, uh, to serve as a legal advisor at the Human Rights Chamber, um, just as uh, six individuals were being transported from um, Bosnia to Guantanamo. Um, I didn't appreciate the significance of working on that case at the time, um, but considering that it became the first leading judgment in the US civilian courts on the rights of detainees in Guantanamo, it obviously became a very significant case. It also showed me the, the power of the United States over smaller nations. Um, this case involved uh, six Algerian nationals who had acquired Bosnian citizenship. Uh, they had been in Bosnia for a number of years. They were accused of coordinating an attack on the British and, and US embassies. They were arrested by Bosnian police um, held in custody for three months, and then they were released by, by an order of the Supreme Court in Bosnia through lack of evidence. Um, rather than being released, they were immediately picked up by US forces stationed in Bosnia, um, taken to a military plane, um, stripped of their citizenship on the plane, and then transported to Guantanamo. Um, many of you will have heard of Boumedian, Budela, that were the two lead defendants in this case. And this was really my introduction to being a lawyer. Um, my role was to advise Bosnian judges on the extraterritorial application of the European Convention on Human Rights. And there was an order by this court for them not to be removed. Unfortunately, the US had such power on the, US, on, on the Bosnian uh, government due to funding arrangements that they were um, removed and spent a number of years, and one of them, I believe, is still in uh, Guantanamo. So that was my, my introduction to, to this field of work. Um, in terms of other cases of unlawful extradition, rendition, whatever you want to call it, um, I've recently become involved over the last couple of years, but more recently, uh, with the Syrian conflict. And a number of individuals have been abducted in Lebanon and then taken into Syria. And one case in particular uh, involves the former vice president of Syria, uh, who is now, I believe, 91 years old. And uh, next week will be the, uh, the two-year anniversary of his abduction. He was, ab he was abducted by Syrians in Lebanon um, and has, has been effectively in prison in Syria uh, for almost two years. Uh, I'm quite fortunate that I'm traveling to um, Lebanon uh, later this week as there is now a, a repeated call for, for his release and a, a former mem member of the Irish government has potentially negotiated the release of uh, 59 political prisoners. That's the upside of the work. Uh, there are of course many downsides of the work and it is very difficult. The Bangladesh case um, I will have to speak about because I don't think I can speak about the rule of law without speaking about Bangladesh. In 1971, there was a brutal armed conflict in which, depending on what side you look, either several hundred thousand or a few million people were killed. Primarily, the Pakistani uh, armed forces are responsible for the majority of the crimes that were committed. But there has been no system of justice um, to deal with that until very recently. Uh, there's legislation from 1973. This process was set up as a military tribunal in 1973 to deal with a number of Pakistani prisoners of war. Unfortunately, that process ended in an agreement between India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh for, in the interest of peace and stability for there to be effectively uh, no more trials. So a culture of impunity um, that has pervaded Bangladesh politics for the last 42 years uh, continued. And until very recently with the current government, this was used as an election pledge to um, rid the country of war criminals, as they said. 
Um, in the introduction, you said that of the courts that I've appeared before, the International Crimes Tribunal in Bangladesh is one of them. I'll correct you by saying I almost appeared before the International Crimes Tribunal, um, but I was thrown out of the country um, on, on the words of the uh, immigration officials at the airport for uh, representing war criminals. So this particular tribunal is now being used to target uh, an Islamic political party, uh, which is the opposition party in Bangladesh. And almost the entire leadership of this political party, a mainstream conservative Islamic party, is now on trial. Now, I'm not here to um, profess the innocence or otherwise of my clients, but this is a process which is so far removed from justice that we've referred to it as um, Guantanamo in Southeast Asia, because there are so many similarities. My role has been, and this is what I wanted to speak about in particular, um, is that you, in addressing a problem such as this, where you know you will never ever be able to enter a courtroom, that you will never be able to represent these individuals, you have to fight the case on a different uh, battleground. Now, we have had to uh, bring international attention onto these cases. We've had to uh, educate various agencies of, of the United Nations to try and put pressure on the government to hold these trials in accordance with what we would call international standards. Now, when you look at this process from beginning to end, um, you have a number of individuals who were hand-picked by the current government. Very prompt investigations. All interrogations in the absence of counsel. Please entered in the courtroom without prior legal advice. And we're talking about uh, crimes against humanity and genocide charges. And three, three weeks, effectively, to prepare for trial. There have been instances of witness abductions uh, with defense counsel, um, local defense counsel, uh, being threatened. And our entire um, team at Nine Bedford Row uh, none of us are allowed in, into the country, all on the basis of what we've said. I myself have been reported to the Bar Standards Board for misconduct in relation to the criticisms that I've made of this process. Um, I was actually told by a US attorney who specializes in this field that you're not a real international lawyer until you've been reported to your bar. Um, so so I, 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 I've now broke my duck. Um, but it, it is a very difficult process because you are having to, to fight something far greater um, than the charges. Um, we have all been accused, I think I myself have received the brunt of the accusations, um, that I am um, a Saudi Wahhabist. Um, I, I have... Uh, <laughs> uh, you haven't seen the photograph on Facebook. Um, but there, there have actually been photographs on Facebook where I look quite different to how I am now. Um, but the, the difficulty is how do you represent individuals in such a way, whether you're dealing with a system of rendition, whether you're defending individuals such as in Bangladesh, or you're representing individuals in Guantanamo. As a result of the work on Bangladesh and the advocacy that we've done, um, I was also approached to, uh, to join one of the defense teams at Guantanamo, so I'm, I'm also working on, on that process. That pre presents a very, very difficult challenge because we have been successful in the way that we have addressed these concerns in Bangladesh. And so we've had congressmen and senators in the US speak out about this system of justice, which is, on, on one level, fairly hypocritical when you read the support they give to Guantanamo for exactly the same reasons. So it does create a uh, a, a challenge, to say the least, when you are looking at these two institutions. But this is a fascinating area of law to work in, and it does require you to be far more than just a barrister. Um, it requires you to, to embrace uh, skills of a lobbyist, which 
not many lawyers are really willing to, uh, to, to embrace, but particularly with the way that the, uh, the, the legal profession is currently, the international work pre presents a, a challenge for many different reasons, but it does require you to, uh, to, to think outside of the box. Now, a lot of what has been said tonight is um, very depressing and is full of the difficulties. Um, but there, there is, I would like to think, light at the end of the tunnel, that there is a way to address these types of cases. But it does require you to, to be, um, I think the words you used, creative and innovative. It's the only way to deal with cases such as this. Your hands are tied constantly. Uh, we, have, we have had to face, whether it's dealing with Bangladesh or dealing with uh, the Lebanese cases, that you are constantly working, um, it's almost as though you're, you're, you're swimming through treacle. It is a very, very difficult challenge. But you have to, uh, you have, you have to realize the important role that you're playing in highlighting uh, the, some of these concerns and whether it's the, the problems with the legislation, or whether it's government interference, or whether it's just not having access to your clients. Obviously, not having access to your clients presents challenges in itself. Uh, but I'd like to just read one thing very briefly. Um, when I was first told that what I was doing uh, breached my code of conduct, and that it was inappropriate for a barrister to act in such a way, um, I started to regurgitate um, a particular rule of our code of conduct, which I think we should all, all remember. A barrister must promote and protect fearlessly and by all proper and lawful means the lay client's best interests and do so without regard to his own interests and to any consequences to himself or to any other person. And I think that's something that we all have to think of when we're dealing with these cases. You will constantly be challenged. You will constantly be threatened. and You are representing clients that nobody else wants to represent and that the uh, <coughs> particularly uh, governments such as the United Kingdom, the United States, would rather not have proper representation. In Bangladesh, we have had to pioneer what we call Skype representation um, because we can't get into the country, so we have to think um, creatively and innovatively how can we represent these individuals. Um, I was asked to focus on some of these issues, and I can see that I've now been rambling for uh, far too long, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions on this. And I, and I would like to, to focus uh, just finally on, on the situation in Bangladesh, in that this system is supposed to be aimed at justice. It's supposed to be aimed at bringing a just resolution to numerous victims that suffered during 1971. Whether we look at the Bangladesh conflict, the Syrian conflict, any other uh, situation that requires a judicial response. As a lawyer, as lawyers, it is our role to ensure that whatever process we participate in is a system aimed at justice. And I think um, the message that I would like to send is that is what I strive to do in the work that I do. Um, and I will continue to do. Um, I appreciate that uh, what I've said bears absolutely no resemblance to the title given to what I was supposed to talk about tonight. Um, <laughs> but as I was asked to, to, to consider the creative and innovative role of lawyers in today's age in dealing with these cases, I thought it was most appropriate that I said that. Thank you.